Okay, so, well, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, we, uh, as, as some of you know, um, we have been uh, doing some uh, 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 seating trainings across the UK. And uh, in some of our uh, trainings, uh, we always talk about measuring, right? Measuring the, for the seating system, um, cushions, bags, and on, on, the, on the bags, uh, we always have some questions about, you know, how far should I go? What are the measurements, the, the proper measurements for uh, the, the, the back supports? Uh, does it matter if I have a low tone client, a high tone client? You know, does it matter if I have a tilting space uh, chair, if I'm, yeah, I'm using a headrest or chest harness? And the idea of this webinar is to go over those uh, those questions, okay? To go over that uh, that uh, those those uh, problems that we have with our, our all of our um, um, clients. So uh, we thought about uh, doing something different for you guys. So instead of going to this uh, uh, kind of a boring uh, webinars where we show a lot of uh, slides and we talk about a lot of different, uh, you know, but but follow, following a, a, a scheme on, on uh, just using the slides, we, uh, me and Bart, we decided, okay, let's do this a little bit more interactive for you guys. Let's uh, do an interview, okay? So um, I'm going to present myself. I'm Philippe. I'm from Portugal. Right now, I'm um, I'm in charge of all the international business for stealth. Um, and uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, education out there um, across the world, Latin America, uh, Europe, um, Asia and Australia. Uh, Bart and I are going to travel to Japan next week and in Australia as well. And um, and with us, we have this phenomenal human being called Bart van der Haven, uh, an amazing PT from Belgium. Uh, a little bit crazy in the head, but, uh, you know, that's what we like. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Bart present himself a little bit, talk a little bit about what he does and uh, and uh, why he does what he does. So Bart, tell us a little bit about you. All right, this human being uh, <laughs> is going to introduce himself. I'm from Belgium. I'm a physical therapist. I have my own clinic with my wife, and I also do training all over the world under the under the name of Sucre Seating. Yeah, so that's me. Perfect. So let's go right to it. OK, guys, so um, uh, the first question that I have for you, Bart, you know, it's the, the, the back support height. So the, uh, it's always been a problem, right? Um, and, um, and, and, and we do know that the back support somehow allows me to better control my pelvis. So it's not only about the, 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 the back of my client, but it's also about uh, seating positioning in general. So if I talk about back supports heights, um, is it correct if I say that I can't or shouldn't start measuring for their height from the top of my cushion? Is that correct if I say this? I would say yes, that's uh, correct. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to dig in a little bit on this, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I, I, you know, I tried to visualize a couple of things, so I, I made a couple of slides just to make sure everybody can follow because we don't have like, uh, you know, it's an online format. So the question was, should we start measuring at the top of the cushion to measure up the back support height? Right. And I, you know, there's a lot of things involved, you know, so if you, you know, I, I just want to tell you before we start, and everybody's an individual, you know, everybody uh, is an individual. So usually if you talk about back support interventions and you're thinking about doing that for a wheelchair user, it must serve a purpose. And then you need to know a little bit of brains, you know, what, what do I need to know about back supports? And then you have to assess your client. Your client is always an individual. Perhaps he or she has limited mobility of the hip joint or uh, perhaps there are shortnesses of the hamstrings. So you, you probably have to assess so you know what you can do and what your outcome is. And then you can start building. Um, and then before you build, you probably got to measure it, uh, look at the equipment and all that. And then you're going to track to see if it works. And I call that the BART method because B-A-R-T. 
love it. I love it. Okay, <laughs> yeah. quiet method. Okay, give right. us a little bit more right. of that. Right. So, so the question really is, uh, you know, there's there are so many bags out there, you know. So, tension adjustable bags, and then you have tall back supports, lower ones, a bit custom molded ones, you know. So you have all kinds of back supports. Um, so, and and my uh, bar interhar pointed out that we have to use first of all the right terminology. And of course, I would do wouldn't dare to disagree with him. And and I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, we don't talk about uh, back rests. Uh, we talk about back supports because the back rest is is basically a support, but it doesn't necessarily point to the function of the back support. So we want a you know a support of the back. We don't talk about a rest. A rest is just something that has no specific or active function. So that's very important. And we're going to talk about height, but there's a little bit of a, an issue when we talk about terminology. Uh, we're going to talk about the vertical dimensions of the back support. And that's basically if you buy or want to order one, your vertical dimensions of the back support as it comes out of the box. And then uh, that's going to be part of your assessment where you're going to place it, how 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 high that vertical dimension should be you know you're going to talk a bit more about that and then you your height is uh, according to ISO 16840 defined as the distance from the top of your back support this part or this part to a reference point and that reference point can be a seat cushion or the floor and that's your back support height you know so but that's your height so there's two things. You have the height, uh, back support height, and you have your vertical dimensions. And the vertical dimensions will be unique to a client. And uh, that's the, the terminology that we got to use. Makes a lot of sense. So we all talk about the same thing. If you want to know more about terminology, you can find this document. It's for free. I, uh, and, and it's uh, on, the, on this website. You can find that. It's a fantastic resource. But that's just to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. Uh, vertical dimensions and height is uh, not necessarily the same thing. OK. And then I just want to, you know, so if you're talk, talking about active functions about of a back support, what we probably are looking at in terms of positioning is to provide PSS support and lumbar support. And PSS support is basically the purpose of the PSS is to give a force high on the pelvis. And we hope that that force will contribute to an anterior or an extension of the pelvis, an anterior tilt or an extension of the pelvis. All the systems kind of, in my opinion, all the systems on the market are kind of based upon that principle. And if you think about that, you know, so where does the force need to be? Well, if you're looking at your pelvis and the rotation point of your pelvis being the hip joint, then everything higher than the hip joint potentially has a, a, a can generate a force towards uh, extension of the pelvis or anterior pelvic tilt. And of course, if you go low on that uh, zone, uh, low or a little bit higher than the rotation point, your force has to be a lot higher because you have a short lever. So you want to have that force as high as possible. And a common understanding is that we put that force on the PSIS level, this area. But if it is a bit higher, you know, this is the iliac crest, um, that's also good. You know, so between the PSS and the and the and the iliac crest would be a, a good area. So that's that's kind of the concept of back support. Okay. And if you you know and, and and something else. So normally you have tissue here. So that's your tissue. And if you have a force below that rotation point or at the same level as the rotation point, you're going to have at the same level will cause uh, a shift forward. So that's going to define your seat depth. So you don't want to reduce your seat depth of your cushion. And if it's going to be lower than that, well, then you're going to give a force under the rotation point, and that's going to favorize a posterior pelvic tilt. So if you have if you have tissues here, it's usually not a good idea to have a force 
there that will generate a posterior pelvic tilt unless the purpose of your back support intervention is to provide a posterior pelvic tilt just just to get a concept straight you know so okay, okay. Got it. is that so, making sense yes yeah? perfectly and and uh so just to clarify and to see if i get it right you know if i start measuring from the top of my cushion and apply the, the back on the top of my cushion and we see this uh, across the globe you know a lot of people a lot of us are doing this uh so this is not if i wanted to stabilize the pelvis not allowing the pelvis to go into a, a posterior pelvic tilt this is probably not going to work because of all the reasons that you just pointed out am i correct yeah correct so just just to explain the concept it's, it's basic biomechanics a force okay. higher than the rotation point is giving you force towards extension and a force lower than the rotation point is going to give or favorize a posterior pelvic tilt if that's really what you're looking for a client then it makes sense to start lower on the pelvis with your support and if it doesn't if you're looking for active extension um, then of course you got to consider higher on the pelvis yeah. okay let's let's elaborate a little bit on that comment because <clears throat> So you're saying that if I want to bring the pelvis to a, a more neutral position or to an anterior pelvic tilt, I should start measuring the back at around the PSIS, around that. Right. But if I have a posterior pelvic tilt already that is fixed, for instance, should I change the way I'm measuring? Well, if it's fixed, you know, I, I always have a problem with the word fixed because uh, fixed means that there is no pelvic mm -hmm. to tie angle movement possible, okay. right? That's what we would define. But yeah. then we got to determine what that fixed position is. Is it in this position? Is it in that position? Is it in that position? So you still need to assess what the pelvic to tie angle would look like. And then your question can be, um, is it fully fixed or is it part, partly fixed to neutral? So partly fixed to neutral is that um, you can move it from here till here, for instance, or from here, and and then it's fixed, right? But there is a limitation somewhere, and and your assessment will inform you about that. You know, you should do an assessment, and that can be very simple: a passive range of motion assessment of your hip joint and see if there's an orthopedic uh, limitation, for instance. And then an other assessment should be, for instance, soft tissue, you know, like your hamstrings uh, mobility. Hamstrings are biarticular muscles. They run from the ischial region to the proximal uh, fibula and uh, tibia. And if that muscle is short, then you will have a limitation in the pelvic to tie angle, right? So difficult to do right now but there are fantastic assessment tools out there or and, and I have also worked on a couple of techniques that can actually uh, investigate the relationship between the knee joint uh, the angle between the femur and the tibia and and the impact of that angle on the pelvic to tie angle because if it's a biarticular muscle and the isocrural muscles are short then this angle uh, which is usually a static angle because the wheelchair user has their feet supported on the foot supports, which basically means that the tibia is immobile and the fibula is also more or less at the same spot. That basically defines this angle. And then that angle has an impact on the mobility of the pelvic to tie angle. And, and uh, so there is, you need to investigate the length of the issue crurals or um, the biarticular muscles in relationship to uh, a knee angle or a femur to, to tibia angle. That's very important because if you don't, it might be very mobile. But yeah, that's uh, hopefully something that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, so, think, yeah. Hold on, so with, you, uh, I think that Diane has something. Yep, just picking yeah. up a, a chat question um, from Barrand with a fixed hip angle, there's always a possibility to change the seat cushion, horizontal angle to change the absolute angle of the pelvis. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, but once you selected that seat cushion, your position of your femur will be constant. And then when the wheelchair user is resting on the foot support, that knee angle will, will then be 
uh, static or defined. And then the trick will be to understand what that knee angle means in, in terms of pelvic to tie angle mobility. So the cushion will be de determining uh, has an impact on both of those angles. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Bart. Yeah. All right. So I, I, I so. think it's it's a good idea to really understand that concept. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good. OK, so I think we got it uh, um, figured out that we should not start measuring at the top of the cushion. It's going to be around the PSAS area. Now, what about the top of my back? Where, where should I stop? Should I go right. to shoulder level, you know, uh, scapula? What is the, 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 your opinion on that? Well, I, I try to uh, investigate. So if your goal is to try to influence the pelvic to tie angle, that area between the PSS and the uh, hip crest or the iliac crest is a good area to start measuring from, right? And okay. and um, yeah, and and that that area, if you're really connecting the the iliac crest here, and I think it will understand the dimensions of your chair. Uh, of your back support uh, in a while, but if you take that, that's around L4 level. And the PSS is uh, is around S1 level, S1, S2. Yeah? So that's basically where you start measuring from. So again, if you're, you know, you start measuring here, if you want to influence that angle, and if you do this, well, it's more of a support or it can even contribute to posterior pelvic tilt okay and then and then there is this hardware you know so all back supports if you have a solid back support they have different hardware options and, and it's basically this one connects the tubes to the back support right and what options do you have i don't know why these arrows keeps dancing but that wasn't the purpose but you can you can then slide your back support up and back from the from those uh, brackets here you see those brackets so that gives you a height adjustment and, and you know all the back supports are more or less the same in principle uh, and then you can also rotate uh, the back support forwards or backwards so i tried to do that with those arrows but they don't dance in the right direction and then there is also a depth arrangement so the the height here can help you with positioning the back support at the right spot this one will probably help you with kyphosis but we will get into that and then the next one, the third one, is basically helping you with the push. You know, so the push is basically giving that force forward in order to try to actively influence the pelvic uh, pelvic to uh, pelvic to tie angles. Yeah, that's, that's so. One more one more reason for us to really start measuring at the PSIS, right? Because if I want to recline the back somehow, and if the the back is lower, then I'm going to push my client forwards, right? Exactly. And I tried to, you know, perfect, you know, perfect, uh, perfect connection here because I tried to do that. I tried to explain that with this slide. If you start measuring right above your cushion and then you're using the rotation adjustment of your back support, remember that pivot point is going to be around here. So if the pivot point is going to be here, that's going to create a push forward on the pelvis and, and on the lower part below the rotation point and that's going to favorize a posterior pelvic tilt so that's definitely not uh, what you're looking for in most cases and if it's at the sacrum that rotation is just going to influence your seat that so that's also not really a, a good idea yeah <laughs> yeah fantastic yeah yeah, yeah and and then and, and then I, I just, I just, you know, you don't have to take my word for it, but um, you know, I just looked up a couple of manuals of uh, some back supports, and some manufacturers even have this statement in their manual. You know, so the center of the bottom, yeah, blah blah blah, and then it says approximate the lower part of the back should be at the level of the PSS or as one or two spinal levels of the individual. And with and that's the whole purpose, you know. So that's actually in some of the manuals. You know, that's a, a direct uh, quote from the manual. So, so it's not just me. And also that's why some manufacturers offer 
privacy flaps. And here in Belgium, nobody knows about privacy flaps. Uh, they probably because we start measuring, we, we place the height uh, of the back support too low, or we start measuring from the top of the cushion. And of course, if you're placing it at the PSS or below the LA crest, um, there is a gap. There's a significant gap, and the danger could be that the cushion slips uh, away. But also, if it's cold and windy, I don't know if you had a storm as well, uh, Philippe. You yeah, had a good storm here. Yeah, it might be very cold. Um, so we call that privacy flap, and so you don't people don't see your butt buttocks if your pants have uh, uh, dropped a little bit as well. So privacy <laughs> flaps. So in Belgium, nobody knows or not a lot of people know about it. And um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's the purpose of those privacy flaps. Privacy flaps are always, always good and they have a point. I guess yeah. now we understand why we have those. <laughs> because exactly. the back should be higher on the PSIS. Very good part. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and then if you talk about the vertical dimension, so that's the starting point, the vertical dimension, you also have to have an end point, right? Yeah, correct. And the end point, yeah, I, I looked into that, you know, so I, I wanted to give you uh, a good overview and I looked at the biomechanics of the spine. And if you're looking at the idea of placing it roughly around the PSS area, you know, in order to influence the pelvic to tie angle, you have then a couple of scenarios possible. So this is a, a, a normal spine, but of course nobody sits in a normal curvature of the spine. Why? Because it requires a lot of active energy. Most people cannot do this. And so they don't sit in a physiological lordosis at the lumbar spine. And probably you don't sit in that position as well right now. And you probably have uh, a stronger kyphosis at the thoracic level. Uh, than what we consider normal. Uh, normal doesn't exist uh, in our world, and um, that's the case also with wheelchair users. So it's very typical that people in the relaxed posture sit with a posterior pelvic tilt or a slightly neutral or towards posterior pelvic tilt, and that causes your lumbar spine to flatten. You see there is almost no yeah. curve anymore. And then the thoracic curve is accentuating. So you have a stronger thoracic flexion. That's normal. And if, okay. if it's structural, you would even expect that to be worse and fixed or to a point fixed, uh, obviously. And then in order to have, have a neutral head position, you need to hyperextend your neck. And we did a program on head supports. And that's basically the connection between feet and, and, and a head, you know, so there's a, another connection in the opposite direction as well. But that's basically what's going on. So keep that in mind. So you have, so, so th those are anatomical pictures. So that's basically, I use a software program simulating the biomechanics of a fixed and a, a passive position. So, yeah. okay. So having that in mind, where should I start measuring now? Yeah. Okay. So, if you have that and, and you're trying to, uh, you're starting at, at this area, we discussed that. Yeah. Well, you can imagine if you have a new neutral spine, yeah, and, 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 and the back supports, solid back supports are kind of vertical supports and that you can put some foam in there to accommodate, but in essence, they are a mainly two dimensional support and all the three dimensional support. You can do some of the adjustment with the back support, but if if your back support is in is is in the position like this and it's tall, it's a uh, higher thoracic, uh, the end point of the vertical dimension or the upper part of the vertical dimension, and you have a, a flexion tendency. Well, you see there is a big gap here. You see, and if that gap is structural, you see there is a, a very big gap too, and a gap usually means that, yeah, if it does make contact with your body. And if it does make contact with your body, it's not contributing to an active function of the user, right? Is, is that making sense? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. But okay. Yeah. So if I if I'm I'm thinking about a client that um, really needs the back support to uh, increase function, okay. Yeah. Um, should I have a taller back or a lower back? Because we we yeah. see we see all this depending. Uh, we always see like the, the the spinal cord injury paraplegics, for instance, using very low backs and are very active, right? And 
and then in the end they slide uh, off the chair because they need to rest. But we also see taller people like me, for instance, using taller bags because they like the contact. So where should I stop? I mean, should I go up to the shoulder? Uh, should I sh stay at the the shoulder the the shoulder blade? You know, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, well, I, I try not to have an opinion. I try to stick with facts. And um, I started with this here because it was raining last night in Belgium. Uh, and uh, so if, if there is a lot of rain, you're going to have a lot of rain catching there. And it's not contributing to function. And I'm going to try to um, go back on the on the anthropomatic data. If you're looking at adults, adults, uh, adults, then you, you know, I could find a couple of measurements. Um, and I think those are the 95 percentiles. So th this is an adult male. Um, so that's about as tall as it gets. And it fits these these dimensions fit for a, a 95 percentile. And if you're looking at the distance between L1 to the PSS. So that's your PSS and L1 is here. So that's the top of your lumbar spine. That distance is almost 15 centimeters or almost six inches, right? Um, so that's that's let's say 15 centimeters, okay. right? And if you're looking at your total uh, spine length, including of your thoracic spine length, including L1, so this all the way to thoracic one would be 36, 36, right? And your PSS all the way up would be then 61 centimeters, right? So you got this, right? So then I put this into our biomechanical model. Um, so PSS to C7 is 59 centimeters. Uh, I hope centimeters is okay. Thoracic, uh, yeah, and then T6, T7 to L1 is 18 centimeters. So T6, T7 is where the apex of the thoracic spine is probably the most pronounced. That is, you, you got to see it like a banana or a sausage, right? And the sausage has a bend to it, and that bend would be around T6, T7, right? So that's what you got to remember. So if I start measuring, so if, oops, I don't know. If, yeah, so if you have, a back support here, right? Then it makes contact with the apex, right? Correct. And all this is a rain catcher, right? So the apex being T67 till L1 is 18 centimeters. And then uh, L1 to PSS is 15 centimeters. You're adding those values up and then you have 32 centimeters being uh, uh, 32, perhaps 33 centimeters. Uh, so that would be the vertical dimension of a back support in most cases where it has an active function on the user. Yeah. And that, yeah. Is, that is the same if I have um, a, a structural kyphosis or even worse. Structural kyphosis is, is basically, wait, the structural kyphosis will have a stronger apex or a more more pronounced apex, so the contact area will be uh, will be always that that the, that top of the apex being T sixty seven. So right. I, I see a lot. I, I I still remember I had a spinal uh, a user with a spinal cord injury, and he had a structural kyphosis developed over the years, and he had a, a pressure injury on T sixty seven, the procrastis spinosi on a solid back support and the reason why was yeah it's there's the apex the, the apex is the strongest there he makes contact there there's a lot of movement sweating perhaps vulnerable tissue and the apex is pronounced makes good contact there and everything above the apex is is, is bending more forward you know that's basically what happened so okay. even with a structural kyphosis that contact area will be the same yeah so let's 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 see if we get it this clear. Um, is it okay for the majority of our clients uh, to measure the back to the top of my shoulders? Let's not talk about itone. Itone is a different conversation, right? 
but let's take yeah. let's take the, the examples that you have here. OK, so I know right yeah. now my effects of my curve is going to be T67. Is it is it bad for my client if I have a, 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 a back support that is taller than T67? It's or only not? bad. It's only bad if it rains, right? If it rains, <laughs> it catches or it snows, it's bad. And another thing is you have more weight to your wheelchair, right? You have more material, more weight. So if you if you're considering that, um, it's probably not a good idea. But in terms of support, if people are not using tilt or don't have tone, if it doesn't make contact with your body, it's not an active uh, support. It's basically too much. Yeah, too okay. much. And it's even worse. So it's, it's, I, I'm going a step further. Almost more than 35 uh, centimeters is 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 in most cases uh, too much. It's not contributing. Yeah. And and can you can you say that it's even worse if I have like a, a kind of a molded back? So you say that oh I have this empty space that is going to catch all the rain. So what if I do a molded back and and I fill out that space and I'm touching the top of my uh, my spine above T6 and T7? Uh, with this molded back is that making it better or worse yeah but you gotta also think yeah then then it doesn't matter then it may make increase your contact area and and if you increase your contact area your loading will be evenly distributed but in general you don't want to exercise a force higher than the apex if you generate a force higher than the apex it's going to accentuate uh, flexion that's usually what you don't want. You know, you don't want to give drastic flexion when you're supporting. So bear that in mind. If it just makes contact, it's probably acceptable. But if you're giving a force, then people will be uh, will be you will facilitate a flexion flexion of the thoracic spine. Okay. Something else. Keep that in mind too. If you are in mm -hmm. a wheelchair, you're not sitting passive all the time. You know, you're also doing things like using your arms and part of that mobility of your up, upper extremity also comes from the thoracic spine because the glenohumeral joint is not just the, the only joint responsible for shoulder mobility the glenohumeral joint also has uh, it, you know you basically have the the scapula that slides over your thoracic spine and the scapula is then connected uh, to um, uh, to the front with the clavicle bone so it basically means that if you want to reach or extend that sliding of that scapula is needed. And secondly, you're also using your upper trunk to go to the end of the range of motion. So it facilitates or it can help facilitate with upper extremity mobility. Right. But if in the case that I have um, um, a kyphosis that is structured, I'm not expecting my client to go into extension and be able to do all these movements, right? So he's going to be more passive in that position. Let's talk about, for instance, an elderly uh, person. So he's going to stay in that kyphotic position. So I'm going to have that empty space. Uh, should I be concerned about those movements or or, or not? Yeah, well, I, I would still be because it's not just the arm support move, uh, the arm movement that will be important. It's also your head movement. So right. if you are looking upwards and in a seated position you sit down all the time but in the case of an elderly person um you know imagine the person also likes to watch tv and the tv is quite high up you know so it's on the ceiling in the nursing home or long-term care facility and then if the person wants to do hyperextension that's fatiguing because the movement is only a, a cervical movement but if it, if the person can compensate with the upper thoracic region and move that one backwards, then it can be easier for that person to control the head. Yeah. OK, so yeah. um, I think I think that uh, everything then above the T67 should be considered in a very particular way for a very special client for something in mind. Is that what you're saying, yeah. right? OK, yeah, I so, would say that. So uh, yeah. we will say that the general rule will be up to two six three seven. Yeah, general rule. If if be careful, I have to, you know, if, <laughs> if you ask a question in our field, you can never say it is this. It always depends because we have complex users. 
But I, I give you this. Remember, so this, you know, so if you're looking at palpation skills, you know, so if you're palpating an adult, um, then you see that the lower apex of the scapula corresponds with T8. So it's slightly above the expected apex of the thoracic spine. Uh, the thoracic spine has 12 vertebras. So the apex would be roughly around T7. So um, there is a, the consideration. I, I said, well, if you're moving your arms, your scapula also moves up and down, especially towards the end of the extension or flexion because the glenohumeral joint is part of the mobility of the upper extremities. It's also your clavicle sliding up or back on your thoracic cage. And if you want to test this, you know, you can palpate your own uh, apex of the lower apex of the scapula. And if you're moving upwards, you see it sliding upwards. And if you're moving down, it's moving down on the thoracic spine. So if you have uh, an active user, yeah, you, the T6 is a good point because that allows you to have migration of the scapula over the thorax. That's a good spot. And um, and then if you're palpating your armpits, usually the axilla, you know, so you don't want to have a force there because there's often nerves, uh, superficial peripheral nerves there. So then you would be around T6 level as well. You know, if you're staying a couple of fingers away from it. So that basically makes sure that your contact area with that soft tissue is never there. So that's usually a good sp spot to have your client. So if the client has enough stability, you can do T10. And then that's more from a postural point of view. And then you can also say, look, I want to make sure I'm stabilizing the client. Well, if you're stabilizing, you can probably go a bit higher, uh, but then you cannot probably go too high as well, because if there's no contact area, it's not going to contribute to stabilization. But perhaps you have contours of the back support that can that can go a bit higher and that gives more stability, right? But if there is no contact, uh, then it's not going to provide stability. Yeah. <laughs> OK, yeah. that makes sense. That makes sense. And um, I think, uh, Diane, you have another question for us. Hello. Yes, I'm conscious we've only got 20 minutes or so left. So this is quite a big question from Baron um, in the UK. So how do we get around the challenges uh, that crash testing requires limited movement of the upper body? So therefore, taller backs are the only ones to pass the test with crash test dummies. Yeah. Well, I, I would my answer would be a risk assessment. If your client is not going to is not going to use uh, the back support in a motor vehicle, then it's a risk assessment. You know, so I, I, I think it comes down to remember the BART method. You know, it's what is your purpose of your intervention? You know? So what are you trying to do with this intervention? Um, and then you sometimes have to make a compromise. And um, yeah, and perhaps perhaps if yeah, and and then inform people about the risk because you you know that would be my answer to that yeah so okay. yeah and that that I, I think that uh, that question uh, comes a little bit in line with the the next question that I have for you which is um, if I have a tilting space chair right does it make sense that I have a t6 t7 height back or should I uh, get probably a little bit higher. Yeah, well, one of the exceptions is if you have a tilt in space, you know, so if you have tilt in space, you, your chair is here. And if you have contact mid thoracic, you know, and gravity would probably facilitate and you have a flexible thoracic spine, then gravity would probably facilitate a thoracic extension. And if you have a thoracic extension, it probably makes sense to go a little bit higher. So you have more support when or so so the thoracic spine is supported when it extends you know, so that that makes sense but again higher than t1 would also not make sense because t1 is is always a boundary because you, your cervical segments you don't want to support them with a back support you want to support them you want to support your cervical segments with a, a head support right yeah. correct correct yeah so um, okay, I think I got that. The, the tilting space, we need to be careful. Maybe higher, you're saying T1, which is pretty high. 
is that is that the same if if I have if I have a a, a low trunk line, for instance, right? Then I I know that I have a this uh, 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 thoracic or uh, trunk flexion, and then I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to use a taller back T1 level, and I'm going to use a chest harness to kind of a try to extend my thoracic spine. Does that make sense? Because if I have a lower back T6 T7, and if I need to use something uh, on my trunk chest harness or even a head support. It's going to look funny, right? Because it's it's going to be a big distance between the top of the back to uh, whatever I need to use. I know that we have some options uh, to uh, mount the, the the headrest or the head supports. I'm sorry, and the the chest harnesses. But does it make sense to say that if I have a taller back and I have a very flexible uh, thoracic spine, that I can use a taller back as an anchor point to give my uh, extension. Does that make sense or is it absurd what I'm saying? No, no, no. I, I think you, you have two questions. One is the effect of the flexible postural support, uh, the harness, for instance. Mm -hmm. And if your purpose of that flexible postural support is to give extension, then again, then your apex will be here, right? And then the first question I would say is, is this thoracic kyphosis structural, yes or no? That would be an assessment I do. Because right. if I'm trying to yank that upper thoracic area backwards, well, it's just going to increase my sliding tendency or the use of sliding tendency, and it's just going to be painful and discomfortable. So the first thing you do is to do an assessment for the thoracic uh, mobility, which is very simple. In a supine position, you assess the weight bearing, uh, on a hard table, on a therapy table. People usually with a structural kyphosis, they say, well, if, you, if they are in a supine position, they say, oh, I want a pillow because I'm hyperextending my neck where it's painful. Then you know there's a structural deformity. What I then do is I support the head and neck, and then I measure the distance between the therapy table and T1. And, and you can use, for instance, the acromion as a reference point. And then you know that that distance will be the maximal range of motion of the client when you're trying to use a postural support to provide a thoracic uh, extension. Um, again, if you're doing that, it does make sense to do this. For instance, have a contour one all the way up to your thoracic spine if there is mobility, and then yank because it's not going to increase your extension of your thoracic spine. You know, it's just going to support them. Then it's just supporting accommodation. So if you want to work towards extension, it makes sense to assess and then go a little bit behind that. And perhaps uh, so your flexible postural support has um, has a chance to provide extension. If, if if the thoracic spine doesn't, you don't allow the thoracic spine to go backwards, then it's uh, a silly intervention. So that that would be my, the first question. And then your your second question was, uh, it looks funny. Yeah, I agree. If you choose a, a low back and then you put a head support on, you need to bridge a, a big gap. You know, so you need to bridge a big gap. So you can look at hardware that can do that. You know, so um, or you could say, well, I don't really care. I just make something big. And the worst thing that could happen is that rain catches or snow catches. Uh, weight is not an issue. If that's if that's the case, you can go higher eh, all the way up to T1. Um, and, and then you look at the specs of the hardware. For if, you, if you're using head supports, that they go high enough on the occiput, for instance. And another thing is the uh, strap guys, if you're using secondaries, you know, that can help you to go higher on the on the support as well you know so yeah okay got but it. usually the, this type of client will be more uh, more of a passive user so weight is not so much the issue then you're adding a little bit of material the weight is not such an issue uh, as long as it doesn't push your thoracic upper thoracic region forward, forward. it's probably going to be fine yeah. okay. and if they're not in the rain for too long yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, very good. And um, and I noticed that you have a slide for uh, extension or oh, high tone. Um, yeah. What about high tone? Is, is that different? Yeah, well, we talked about tone. Uh, it's funny. We had a, 
Philippe and I, we had a seminar for new motion in the United States and we talked about the head positioning program, uh, what to do with head positioning. And in a way it relates to back supports as well, because the key of head support interventions will often be thoracic interventions. Um, anyway, uh, we also in that program, we said, well, that we have not enough terminology to uh, describe uh, flexion and extension of the cervical spine because we only have a kyphosis, a flexion of the cervical spine and an extension of the cervical spine uh, in, the, in, the, in the depth uh, in, in the sagittal plane. So I said, well, there's a lot of different options that can be the case. At ISS, we introduced uh, more specific terms for the cervical spine. We said, well, it's possible to have a flexion of the C3, C7 segments and an extension of the C1, C2 segment. And it's also possible to have a flexion of the C3, C7 segments and a flexion of the C1, C2 segments. And it's also possible to have an extension of the C3, C7 segments and a flexion of the C1, C2 segments. And it's also possible to have an extension of the C3, C7 segments and an extension of the C2, C2 segment, C1, C2 segments. All this is possible. And especially in neurology, uh, in people with tones, STNRs, you can expect a C1, C2 extension and a C3, C7 extension. And if that's the case, well, the, the, the general rule is that your lower cervical segments, C3, C7, are directly influenced by your thoracic segments. So a thoracic adjustment forwards uh, uh, can can, inf can can influence your uh, C lower cervical segments and your upper cervical segments usually compensate for this. What it means is, I'm just going to erase all the ink here. What it means is that if you have a, an extended C3, C7 segment, it makes sense to give a push forwards with the upper thoracic and thoracic area. So you can do an entire thoracic push forward. That would be the contact area with T7, T67, move that forwards. And also if the thoracic spine is flexible because of tone, for instance, it also might make sense in that case to move uh, T1, T2, uh, T6 forward as well. And the, what it does then is it puts your lower, lower cervical segments in a more aligned position. And then it's much easier to control the upper cervical segments with a head support. So fantastic, you know. So I was I was very frustrated with the fact that we only see flexion and extension of the cervical spine because there's so much more to it. And if you recognize that, you also see that the intervention can be a T1, T2, inter, a T1, T, a thoracic intervention, and that thoracic intervention is then linked to lower uh, pelvis. And, and feet, you know, so and vice versa, you know, so we, we yeah, <laughs> so okay. fantastic. Yeah. So I have two comments. <laughs> I have two comments about that. Comment number one is if I have a high tone client, probably the height of my back support should be a, probably around T1, T2. Yeah, I always, <laughs> I always going to go back, Philippe, with purpose. You know, I, I hope that that someday we will as a therapist define purpose and if if you say well a tone you know so you know a client with high tone well i know a lot of clients with high tone and they're all different so the question would be what are you trying to achieve with this high tone client what is the problem if the problem is to accommodate for a thoracic uh, a, a cervical lower and an upper cervical extension as for instance, in order to control the head, in that case, it would make sense to have a higher buildup on the C1, a T1 to T6 segments. Yeah, sure. and and I, I'm stressing on that because if we if we say the purpose uh, of our intervention, then it's easy to find a biomechanical or a structural way to deal with that for the equipment. And then the equipment will become more interesting because then you can ask a sales rep 
on how much uh, thoracic adjustment do I have on this hardware, for instance, or how much C3, C7 adjustment do I have on the on the head support mounting case, or how much can I do with C1, C2, you know? And then you say, well, ideally I need this range of that uh, area. How much can you offer with your hardware? And then you don't have a sales pitch, but you're dealing with facts that contribute to solving a solution. Yeah. It's all it's all about the facts, right, my friend? Uh, sometimes we just think about things without considering the facts. And I, I just like, I love our conversations because I always learn so much about uh, the BART method that I just love. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all about the facts. The second comment that I had after your explanation was, it's funny that we have, uh, we are talking about backs and we're talking about back support heights and how we, we should measure for them. And we know, first of all, that every client is a unique client. So we need to, uh, like you say, have a purpose. What is our goal uh, based on the assessment that we did previously? But it's funny how the thoracic spine is affecting so much more than just controlling tone or low or high uh, or uh, uh, you know, increasing extension of the thoracic spine will affect only comfort or pressure distribution no it affects the head and it's 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 so interesting to see that the head is so depending on thoracic good position and good function and that is depending on a lot of different things like the backrest heights but also the cushions and foot rest and so on so um it's uh, it's my comment for that i don't know if we have any more questions um diane yeah we do. Um, again, from Baron, in dynamic seating, we may want the L1 PSIS zone to be controlled separately from the upper thoracic area. Linear back supports don't really allow for this. Could we have some comments around biangular or multi-angular back supports? Yes, uh, Baron, of course, has always uh, fantastic questions. Um, I, I, I have, you know, I'm an old guy. I have been uh, thinking about uh, improving ergonomics a long time. And uh, I, I did a study on um, seating ergonomics in general. And I think that uh, we can improve. Uh, we can improve our seating tremendously. If we define our seat as uh, a seat base, being the seat cushion area and the PSS region, right? So, and, and that is an angle adjustable uh, uh, configuration. So you can accommodate to, to, to pelvic to triangle limitations. And then usually we keep pushing on the lumbar spine. And I, I, did, a, I did a study, I, I don't think we have time, but I did a finite element analysis study with a German researcher um, and we presented over the years a lot of the findings from that study. But one of the key findings at the last International Seating Symposium that Alexander Ziefert and I did was that a lumbar spine push is actually causing a lot of shear force and sliding of the user. And so so we think that's the most way of doing it. And uh, we all, all our systems are focusing on PSS and lumbar support. Uh, and I said, well, if we, if we redefine, if we redefine that, you know, so if you say, for instance, we, we have this seat base, so pelvic to a uh, pelvic to triangle control. And then instead of pushing on the lumbar spine, you're gonna allow the thoracic area that can be T, T6 till, till T12 or even, even a bit. If you allow that to move in sync with the spinal movement, allow that to move backwards. Well, what happens is you have a fantastic uh, functional point for your head support. You can control head support in case of structural uh, deformities. But at the same time as you're doing that, well, your pelvis remains where it is. You're going to hyperextend the lumbar spine. So you, you have a, an enigma. You know, it's almost like paradigm shift because the thoracic with a fixed pelvis will increase lumbar 
per when you're moving the thoracic backwards. And, and that provides then a fantastic functional base for your head support. And if that moves in sync and it doesn't cause any shear forces, well, the laterals don't shift, or if users have a head support, the head support doesn't shift. And, and I invented that concept. I designed a chair out of it. And, and uh, I don't know, Philippe, if you want to say something more about this, but um, um, in the United States, uh, we have launched this in a in a wheelchair back for it, which is called Epic Seating, and and I think it's on the it's going to hit the market soon in the UK. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the only thing that I can say about this is epic. This is going to be epic. Everything's going to be epic. Uh, I think <laughs> that's a a lot of the the, yeah. the 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 problems that we have with seating in general. Uh, this seating system with this new uh, different angles of movement and uh, anatomical axis of movement are going to be uh, uh, a lot of problem solving for a lot of different clients that we have. So kudos to uh, Bart to design this. So um, yeah, we run out of time, so we have three minutes. Uh, do we have any more questions about this uh, subject for you guys that uh, you want uh, Bart uh, to answer? If not, then I really appreciate your time. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope that this has been uh, a good piece of information. It was for me. Thank you, Bart. Uh, and uh, I hope that we can repeat this format more time, uh, more times in the future for different subjects. So thank you very much for uh, attending. And yes, the recording, the recording will be sent to all the attendees. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.